through the hour as our panelists take a look at hybrid work and discuss what lies ahead for organizations and their decisions surrounding a return to the office in the coming months. Now let's get to our speakers. Our guest for today has held senior talent positions at top companies such as Virgin Media, BMG Music, and Uber, and broke glass ceilings as Google's first female VP of Human Resources. As a wildly successful practitioner developing talent and leadership, we are ecstatic to welcome Leanne Hornsey, the Executive Vice President and Chief People Officer at Palo Alto Networks. Leanne, hello and welcome. Hey, Sade, it's so fantastic to be here. We're happy to have you. And Thanks. leading the discussion today is an Aussie turned New Yorker who coined the term neuroleadership when he co-founded NLI over two decades ago. Not dating you or anything though. Um, with a professional doctorate, four successful books under his name and a multitude of bylines ranging from the Harvard Business Review, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and many more. A warm welcome as I hand off the reins to our co-founder and CEO of the Neuroleadership Institute, Dr. David Rock. David? Off Thank you, you very much, Sade. Great to be here with you. Thank you for the warm welcome. Um, Leanne, you've gone off camera there for some reason. Um, hopefully we'll get you back. There we are. We're having some fun technical things this morning. Good to be uh, back with you. So um, really excited for this, uh, this session. Um, there's a lot to talk about, so I'm going to dig in. I'm going to share with you all quite a bit of research, um, but also have a conversation with Leanne because uh, Leanne at Palo Alto Networks has really been one of the most passionate advocates for doing hybrid just right. And uh, she'll tell you a bit more about a consortium she's helped put together of many different firms uh, who, who really want to use this time to build a better normal, not just go you know, back to how things are. And Leanne and I kind of connected through various ways and, 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 and had uh, similar thinking. And uh, she was really graciously agreed to help share what, what Palo Alto Networks is doing, but also the broader market and kind of how they're all seeing it. She's very connected in there. Um, <clears throat> so that those of you new to NLI, uh, we're a research driven leadership institute. We're actually 23 years old this year, um, published over 50 peer reviewed academic research papers on the, the, the biological foundations of leadership challenges. Um, advised over 50 of the Fortune 100 and we're based uh, on the ground in more than 24 countries and uh, impacted, I, we, we looked at it recently, impacted over 13 million managers directly. Um, in the last uh, in the last couple of years, so it's been an exciting, exciting journey. Um, we've we've been very passionate about this hybrid situation that's happening because of a number of reasons. Firstly, we went hybrid by choice at NLI about five years ago. Uh, gave everyone a laptop, made everything completely virtual, and still kept offices. We have a headquarters in New York. We have a couple of offices around North America. We have one in London, one in Sydney, a bunch of other places but gave people complete freedom to work where they wanted, when they wanted, work fully in the office, work fully at home, work out whatever mix they wanted. And what, what we found at NLI is actually tremendously helpful for finding the absolute best talent, not the absolute best talent who lived within an hour of the office, uh, but to really find the absolute best talent and increased diversity. It increased actually inclusion and a whole bunch of things. So we we would never go back. Uh, we did it by choice and, and, and spent some time working out how to make it work. But we also know so much of the science is really supporting a lot more flexibilities. We're, being, we're very passionate about this topic. We've been researching things around this topic for quite some time. We've published uh, nine fairly significant pieces of research around this issue, um, either industry research reports or uh, deeper neuroscience reports uh, that, that directly support doing things differently at the moment. We also uh, if you've been following us, have done a lot of publishing this year uh, in Forbes and Fast Company, um, our own blog at many places. I think starting with Build a Better Normal last year, which became a bit of a mantra. We had a big piece called Build a Better Normal, someone could put in the chat maybe. Uh, and then in the last few months, uh, really digging into some of the bigger questions and studying them and then publishing them. So it's been a, a big few months for us uh, thinking about how should companies do this properly. And at NLI, the mantra is pretty simple, follow the science, experiment, and follow the data. Um, and what, I'm, what I want to do today is, is tell you what, you know, what we are seeing in the science. I'm not going to cover everything, obviously, but what we think is most important coming out of the science. So that's the journey. Three chapters. We'll, we'll, I'll pause and take your questions and comments um, as we get uh, as we get into this and, and chat with Leanne a bit more, but I want to talk about autonomy. I think solving for autonomy is really critical. Solve for autonomy, manage for fairness is kind of the big first chapter. 
we'll, we'll definitely dig into the big questions going on at the moment around bias, around innovation, productivity, all of that. Um, and then we'll finish with our current hypothesis on the really critical skills managers need. And we've got some theories on the most fast and effective way to do that as well. So that's the, that's the plan. Let's start off with a little reminiscing, been quite a year. Um, just kind of want to get us in context of where we all are and where we've come from. Uh, March last year, we all uh, had a bit of a shock. <laughs> I think you'll remember. Uh, most people globally actually have suffered some level of acute distress disorder known as psychological trauma. Um, most people had such an overwhelming psychological experience that it literally created a shock experience, very similar to like falling down the stairs and breaking a leg or a car accident or some, something really, really difficult physically. Um, and that shock felt like it would last for months. Remember, it kind of the adrenaline was, you know, months of just going on adrenaline. And then suddenly we, the adrenaline kind of kicked down and we went into this long period of pain. We also thought that would last forever. It actually lasted a long time, really like May to kind of May, really. Uh, we're just starting to come out of this, I think. It's been about a year of just uncertainty, real painful. And then finally, uh, we're moving into this rehabilitation stage. Um, a bit like, not so much like drug rehab, but more like uh, going for physical therapy where you've you know got to re-find the use of a limb. In this case, literally re-find your ability to have social skills for some people. Like literally, you know, be, be comfortable just being around other humans for some. Never mind all this other thing. So it's um, it's a it's a really you know difficult time for a lot of people. A lot of people still experiencing actual trauma. Um, some people very excited for sure. Um, some people happy, had the best year ever. But a lot of people struggling. A lot of managers really struggling, just trying to work out how to help. You know how to um, kind of do something here. Now the backdrop, the backdrop to this is the vast majority of people want hybrid. The vast majority of people, about three quarters from all these different studies don't want to be tied to having to work at home, having to work at the office. They want to be able to do a mix. Um, and there's a good number of people who actually still want to be full-time at home. It's depending on the study, about a quarter to a third in that area. Um, for others, it's about a quarter to a third want to be full-time in the office, right? So it's across the map, but most people, it's pretty safe to say most people really want to do something hybrid. And the context we have for this is that's a great thing. Now, I guess we have a growth mindset about lots of things, not everything, but at NLI, we believe from our own experience and from the science that getting hybrid right can result in some really important things, more diverse hiring, more inclusive practice, less biased decision-making, greater innovation, greater well-being, faster, better learning, greater productivity, all of these things. So that's the that's our point of view. Um, Leanne, anything you want to add in there before we get into the, the sort of solve for autonomy question, just sort of the, the, the background, the context, anything you want to... Uh, jump in there, come off mute and, uh, and, and add it all. Yeah, David, I'm not sure I do because I think you've cracked it. The one thing that I perhaps would say is I'm gonna emphasize something around, you said, follow the science, then experiment and look at the data. And I think as we go through this, we'll see that experimental phase is super key. Yeah, absolutely. Cause you don't know what, I mean, the science gives you a good indication of things to test but you really don't know until you actually do experiments. I mean, that's how science actually works, right? Um, it's really, really important to do those experiments and learn from them. And, uh, you know, as any experiment, uh, you know, you're often surprised uh, in, in both positive and negative ways and just completely surprising ways as well. So I think it's going to be really, really important to, to really follow the data there. So let's dig into this first point. The reason, there's a really big reason we think, or actually three really big reasons why we think autonomy matters a lot. Um, and I think there's an overarching decision that your CEO and C-suite and people leaders, there's an overarching decision that you need to make, which is what are we going to solve for with hybrid? Like, are we going to solve for real estate cost and, you know, addressing that? Are we going to make that the organizing principle? Some companies are, right? Are we going to put this at the heart of your decision, like simplicity? Let's just keep these things really simple, right? And just end up with just like a, a three, two model for everyone, right? simple, scalable, maybe not necessarily the best. Or are you going to solve for how managers feel, which probably end up with bringing everyone back into the office um, full time? Like, what are you going to really listen to? And, and you need to kind of consciously put at the top of your hierarchy one principle, really. I think it comes out of these four. We think it's employee autonomy and manager autonomy, actually both. Um, we think it's really, really important. And there's a bunch of reasons why I'm going to dig into those. 
Um, and I was super excited to see the, the Flexwork uh, consortium that Leanne put together with Uber and Splunk and Box and uh, Palo Alto Networks and some others that, that literally was about you know, driving this whole question. And we've been collaborating a bit with those folks. She'll tell you more about that. But employee autonomy is such a critical foundation. And I'm gonna give you the three reasons why um, and a little bit of the science, and then we'll we'll hear from Leanne like what they've been doing at Pan with this. Firstly, autonomy is one of five big drivers in the SCARF framework. If you know that from us, um, you, you will have heard of it. It's it's the A in SCARF. It's it's a perception of having choice or having control, right? So, um, this was obviously ripped away from us in a big way uh, this year. We felt out of control. Um, it was really challenging, and in fact. When, when something is out of control, it tends to be the highest stress level. It's called, out, it's called uncontrollable stress. Um, when something's really, really stressful, it feels uncontrollable. And then when we find where we have control, it tends to really bring it back. Um, so that's important. So there are three reasons why we think autonomy is the, is the critical thing to solve for. The first one is sort of the most obvious one. This is really easy to understand. People are really wide apart and are very passionate about their position. Right, so you've got here's some fairly recent data. Um, this is uh, this is um, you got 30 percent of people want to be four to five days a week in the office. 31 percent of people want to be th one to three days a week. Sorry, at home, you've got 39 percent of people uh, rarely or never. So it's fairly evenly split. And if you if you talk to the people who want to be at home, they're very passionate about it. They're like, I got my life back from this. I got my kids back. I got my health back, I got my sleep back, I got my diet back, my health, I've got a puppy now, which is about everyone has a puppy now. Um, I want to give up my puppy, I don't want to give up my, you know, all that stuff. And if they, you know, if they force me back, um, you know, stuff's going to happen. And um, what, what we've seen actually, in the, there's a number of different studies coming out, this one's found 59% of people would look for a new job if forced back to the office. Um, there's quite a few different surveys uh, showing similar things. So, you know, People are really far apart. So if you basically say you're all hybrid, about a third of people will be really annoyed. They want it to be full-time in the office. They don't want to work at home. And a third of people will be like, why? I wanted to work at home. I'm way more productive and I'm way more human. Why are you doing this, right? So if you force people into any one of those categories, you're actually going to really annoy about a third of your people. That's the cliff note. <laughs> force people in any one category, you'll annoy, really annoy about a third of your people. And that's not helpful. Um, that's not a good thing. So that's that's you know that's the first reason um, is that people are really far apart and they're really passionate about their their view um, and 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 you know and all that. Leanne, anything you want to add there? You know, what's the what's the data like at Palo Alto Networks and, and what's your experience about people's passion about those different perspectives? Uh, David just put on, and our data almost reflects <laughs> to the number your data. We've taken four surveys during the last 14 months, and we found the numbers are consistently looking like this. And the one thing that I would add is this whole point of control and autonomy starts with believing that you can't be successful if your employees are not feeling aligned to your company. So now we've shifted this paradigm and we've seen what we can do and we've allowed choice. It would be so retrograde and so negative in terms of all of the out business outputs we need to take that autonomy away. So it's not just that we need control, it's with they've experienced it and now there's a danger we're going to remove it which is, would be very, very problematic. Right, right, right. And, and there's really interesting research on that. You know, unexpected threats are the worst. Like if we have a pandemic again in two years, it's going to be much easier on us. It'll still be frustrating, difficult, but it won't be anywhere near as difficult as this one, uh, you know, give or take the, the actual, you know, metrics of it. The, um, because it's much more expected. We know what to expect. We feel more con in control. We know what to do, how to get through it, what the stages will look like, all of that. So, um, uh, you know, Unexpected rewards, like suddenly having all this more autonomy, uh, are also much stronger than expected rewards. But you take away um, a reward like that, it becomes an unexpected threat. And unexpected threats are really strong. So take away this autonomy, even if it wasn't the fact that, you know, a lot of people are being incredibly more healthy and happy and balanced, you know, from this. Even if it wasn't for that fact, if it was just another issue, taking away employee autonomy doesn't ever tend to play well. 
um, in, in any domain and in this domain, you know, particularly so. Um, so this is what we'll probably see. The second reason, and I'll dig into this one a bit more, is, you know, going back to shock, pain and rehab, like autonomy is one of the things that will really help people through their rehabilitation stage, the psychological rehabilitation, um, because it, it literally will gain, it'll, it'll, it'll gain a sense of control for people. And there's lots and lots of research showing that increased autonomy um, significantly helps reduce stress and also lift performance. Uh, and some of the studies on this are just like amazing, I'll blow you away, but I'll, I'll give you the, the basic mechanics of this. So a perception of having a choice where you didn't have a choice, now you have a choice, offers both a sense of predictability and perceived control of the environment. That's really important because the brain is a prediction machine. Literally everything's about predictive analytics in a sense in the brain, working out what's gonna happen next. And with no control, you have no ability to predict and intervene and interact. So autonomy is a, is a very, very primary experience for people and reduced autonomy literally activates a pain network, a very, very similar to physical pain, a very strong threat network that pulls away resources from prefrontal um, and has some, some really strong issues with it. Now, on the flip side, discovering choices turns down strong emotions. So when you are in a really difficult position and you suddenly realize you have some choices, you actually become much more calm and can use that you actually can use that I, I, i'm a scientist i experiment on my kids a lot uh i can't do it much now they're 14 and 18 but i remember actually using this one time on the way to school uh we were late and one of my uh one of my kids was having a meltdown uh just full emotional meltdown and in the middle of it i said hey we've been talking about watches lately do you want a digital or analog watch and she was she was like getting really upset and then I said, no, no, really, look, let me look at my wrist for a second. Do you want a digital or analog watch? Which one do you want? And she like thought for a second and said digital and then calmed down and kept moving. And they've studied this and there's literally when you make a choice, when you discover a choice or make a choice, it flips your brain back into a towards state. Whereas feeling like you have no choices is the away state, is the threat state. So it's such a powerful thing. Um, two really interesting points, really important points. Discovering choices is intrinsically rewarding, even when they may seem trivial and just like incremental and not that important, right? Like it may seem really irrelevant that if you have to bring all your workers back to the office, if it's a factory, for example, I have to bring everyone back. It may seem irrelevant to let people decide to work through lunch and get home earlier or take the, take the lunch. Like, but giving people that choice can actually be really helpful for people. And it's a tiny thing, but it actually be really rewarding as an example. Um, I don't know if that's legally allowed, so don't quote me on that. But it's just an example of, uh, of, of, you know, very small things actually can go a long way to being intrinsically rewarding. And of course, I mentioned this, the effect is strongest when a choice is unexpected. So doing things that people kind of didn't see coming. So there's a lot of workplace research on this. Um, here are some examples of pieces. There's a lot of workplace that people who have greater autonomy actually experience lots of great things. Um, more motivation, higher engagement, productivity, work, you know, all these things. So, I mean, this has really been studied. You can take this to the bank. Um, and just as an example of one like crazy study, just to tell you how poignant this is, um, this is people given permission to basically personalize their cubicle versus you're not allowed to personalize your cubicle. Same cubicle, same computer, same office, same job. But people were given, this is a control group, some people were given the permission to actually personalize their cubicle, put your photos in, put your things in, you know, put stuff up, do it however you want. Those people were 25% more productive. So just think about that. Just letting people play with a little space there, they're a quarter more productive. What do you think it'll be to let them just, you know, choose where to work and how to work and when to work and all those things, right? It's, it's, it's gonna be quite big. So it, it really has quite a big effect. Um, and then finally, really interesting, thing is autonomy is one of those gifts that keeps on giving so you could give people money and the reward networks will have gone a, you know a few weeks later you can give them more certainty it'll do something short term not not much you can increase relatedness and shared goals and bring people together long term it won't do stuff but autonomy has benefits at multiple places like when you're given the choice when you make the choice like if you if you were you know choosing your hours at a factory for example you know, just being told you have this choice now would be rewarding. Making the choice, et cetera, would be rewarding when you do it and it would really activate reward networks. Um, 
you would actually choose the choice that was right for you, which would you know be much more beneficial, and ongoingly you would have benefits um, in you know from from enjoying that. And we I won't dig into this. Maybe my team can put a link into the chat. We just put this article up, but we had a really fantastic conversation um, with some folks from General Mills recently, where, where they talked about uh, giving their uh, literally ten thousand factory workers choice over a thank you gift from the company, either dollars, day, or donation, and um, you can see kind of what people cho chose, but it was incredibly motivating and engaging for people um, in, in this whole process. So my team could put a link in the chat to this. I think we call it a baking in choice. The article is now up uh, and there's also a podcast. You can kind of listen to that. So what we see is that giving people autonomy is, is, is rewarding in multiple different ways and over time. So let me pause there, take a breath. Leanne, um, any comments You know, before we sort of get into tactically how to do this? Any comments on autonomy as a key driver, as a lever, and how have you been using it at, at Palo Alto Networks? And you know, what are your thoughts on it? Well, it's really clear, David. It's super, super critical. Um, and I love the examples David gave of small things. So some of you will be sitting there going, it's going to be really hard for us to give employees autonomy over location because you'll all have to be in the office or whatever. But we have done some really interesting research where we've given people autonomy over when they train, how they learn, what their benefits look like, how they spend their benefits dollars. So for example, we've done a silly little thing that everyone will go, this is crazy. Instead of putting more money into X, let's give you a bit of money. And if you wanna take your kids to Disney, go do that when everything opens. And the amount of positive emails I get into my inbox just because of tiny stuff like that, um, is just incredible. So for those of you thinking, golly, this is tough, it does not have to be. There are so many ways to give autonomy. The second thing that I would just say before I hand back to David is keep giving. You know, David mentioned that this is a, a gift that keeps giving. I talk about sprinkling the fairy dust. So every six weeks, we give a little bit more autonomy over something. And it constantly reminds our employees of all that we've done. Final point, if I look at our employee survey, since we've been doing this comparative to our previous years, even in COVID, when employee sentiment's gone down generally across the world, our employee surveys 10 to 12% higher. And the comments tell us this is why. It's the choice, it's the autonomy, it's the treating me like an adult, not a child. So we bear it out completely. That's great, thanks. And, and I think I just want to land on this slide for a minute. Um, it's some important points. And for those of you who don't know, that it, it, Palo Alto Networks is like 100,000 people in, in just about every corner of the world. So uh, if, if they can do it, uh, it's a big organization. If they can do it, um, you know, you can do it. Um, they've definitely got support from a, a really um, forward thinking CEO who's really supportive of this initiative overall. Um, but they're, they're uh, you know, experimenting really, uh, really powerfully. Um, so just to, you know, just to reiterate this, um, be careful of your leaders, like your CEO, your top team, you know, solving for cost and, you know, call them on this. Like, I, I, what are you solving for? What's your organizing principle for a hybrid decision? Not what are you going to do, but what's your theory for how to solve for hybrid? Is it cost? Is it, is it just asking managers what they will feel more comfortable with? It's a terrible idea. Um, is it simplicity and scalability? Or is it actually to use this opportunity to... Uh, to really get the best possible organization out of this. I mean, this has been an incredible crisis and lots, we've all gone through a lot of suffering in many, many ways. And there are some really good things that we can get out of this. And just going back to how things were is, is, a, is a terrible lost opportunity. And I think all the data and evidence points to you will lose a lot of people, uh, a lot of very good people, probably your most talented people, a good chunk of them will leave, a good chunk of the other people will be really frustrated and you literally will be less productive um, and even less innovative. So I think it's, it's really important to get some urgency, you know, across to your leaders. Leanne, how have you found kind of getting that story in, uh, you know? You know, it, it's, been, it's been fascinating. When, when the pandemic started, our leaders were, oh my goodness, this is disastrous. Let's get everyone back to the office as soon as we possibly can. And the most died in the world leaders with that view are now not saying that. And the reason is simple. Our employees were productive. Our employees were equally or more creative. Our employees delivered. We've just announced results that are probably our best ever. 
yesterday. Right. <laughs> so the data absolutely spoke. And so what I found with our leaders is as they watched it for themselves and they saw that this paradigm could shift, they went, oh gosh, I'm gonna have to let go of my biases. And then one second thing that I'd like to add, this point of cost. So often the debate comes down to cost. You know, I've done work in the past that says every time you lose a person who is high talent and you have to then go and replace, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars. So you might be thinking of cost of real estate, which you can dump over the long term, but really think and maybe do the work around what is the cost of lost high talent? And what is the opportunity cost that's lost if you can't hire them because they want to work in hybrid environments? That yeah. is a very significant argument with your, with your leadership team. Right, but I think you nailed the really important one, which is a lot of organizations are reporting their best year ever, um, literally from a performance perspective, performance, growth, profitability, uh, all sorts of things. Now, some of those are other factors, but even, even accounting for you know, flat industries in this time, um, a lot of organizations reported much better results than, than they've, they'd had before. Um, and, and, you know, and people are really surprised by that. So I think it's really important, you know, we've done this grand experiment there is this data to follow, but let's now give them some of the science so they can understand why you know, things were better um, and kind of what was driving this. So let's dig in a little more. Um, also happy to take you know, a few questions coming in as we get to kind of chapter two, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you um, uh, just a little bit more of sort of the how, and then we'll take some questions as well, see what's coming in. So firstly, um, you know, it's one thing to say, but how do you do it? How are you gonna solve for maximum autonomy? Now, the first thing is, is to actually loosen up your your thinking about this there's no one size fits all for every part of the organization you want to think organizationally about functions that might be in different categories right so firstly think about categories here are some examples of categories full-time in the office full-time at home fixed ratio uh, you know mostly in the office a little at home mostly at home a little at the office like those are five reasonable categories right so think about which functions you know make sense to be in which category now really important i said solve for autonomy manage for fairness so you want lots of input from diverse perspectives up and down the business on this question um and you know because there's some obvious answers but you might get this wrong you want to really listen to your people around this which functions should be in which category for you um, and then the next thing is how many you know, how much freedom can you give the teams uh, to actually then make decisions. So provide some principles for teams to work within. And again, really rethink about, uh, think about this, uh, uh, the fairness issue and get lots of consultation happening, right? Lots and lots of consultation. So organizationally think about functions at the team level, think about principles. And I'll just, I'll just kind of shake up your thinking a little bit on the principal side. Um, give you some examples of principles. So you might set a principle at a team level that, you know, 50% of a team should be in the office on any day or 0%, we don't care, or 100%, whatever it is. But you know, what is the percentage? And maybe it's 50%. And then maybe the team can, between them, work out how to manage that. Maybe some people want to come to the office more. Maybe some people never want to come. Can you balance that out? But from a location perspective, that's sort of an obvious one. There's also an availability perspective. What percentage of a team should be available to work during uh, business hours. So the nine to five, what percentage of people actually have to be nine to five? Is it a hundred? Really? Is it 50? How many people do you need responding to customers, you know, in that time? And then a third question that's really interesting is um, the synchronous hours also. The synchronous hours can really help. So synchronous hours is basically, hey team, how many hours a week do we all need to actually be online at the same time for meetings? Um, and if you can minimize those to maybe 20 or 30, you're really freeing people up a lot. So you're thinking across these different axes um, and giving managers as much control as they can to, um, to actually be able to play with different, uh, different frameworks and different models. So that's, that's kind of how we're seeing it. Um, and as, as, sort of, as, you know, as, as this has sort of started to come up though, you are gonna hit up against all sorts of pushback. Uh, and we've actually written a piece on this. I'm not sure if it's up yet or not. If not, it's about to come out. Uh, the biases driving managers decisions in this. So there's three sets of challenges happening here. I won't dig right into it, but we've written heavily on each of these separately. And we've got a piece on this that should be useful for you. The first one is power dynamics is essentially people with more power 
conceptualize other people as concepts, um, not as humans. And, and essentially that's important for kind of moving people around, thinking about them. But people with high power stop thinking about other people's experience. They stop mentalizing. It's very hard to do what's called perspective taking. Power literally impacts how you perceive others. And so they, they just won't kind of get a sense of how people really feel. The second thing is there's a lot of biases going on. And there's a, the big one is expedience bias, which is kind of cognitive laziness, um, which is just wanting this to be easy and just go, you know, I just want to send one email and everything's back to normal. I think there's also managers like all of us lost control this year in so many places. Um, and I think managers, you know, just saying, hey, we're going back to normal is a way of kind of regaining a sense of control for something that they lost. So that's, you know, another bias that's happening there. There's a safety bias happening. So a safety bias around, well, if I don't see my people, I won't know what's happening. Um, so you've got that one as well. And I think the big one to remember is more autonomy won't necessarily feel good for everyone. So you're going to have managers who feel that like actually giving my employees more autonomy means I've got less. So, um, you know, that's, that's not helpful for me. Uh, Leanne, anything you want to jump in on that, on the sort of three cognitive challenges, any reflections, not just from PAN, but, you know, broadly across industry as well? You know, there's, there's nothing I'd add. I think you've nailed it. Um, I think that third point is really important about how managers feel. And that means we have to make sure that we give them room to discuss that. And we make sure that we support them through this move to hybrid. You know, one of the things that I'm seeing is actually this is an opportunity to really help our managers and our leaders really brush up on their real leadership skill right. because this needs this needs them to be different right they have to really manage differently and lead differently and I'll, I'll share a hypothesis we have that we're exploring around kind of how to do that um effectively at the moment but let's i see a bunch of questions coming in i think i'll save them for now uh, and dig into the big debates because i think some of this content will actually address kind of the questions so, so chapter two is the big debates, right? And the big debates, these, these are essentially things that your leaders will uh, be kind of pushing back on. So one of them will be productivity, right? They'll be, well, you know, people are gonna goof off. Um, actually the research pre-pandemic was people are literally a day a week more productive on average. Certainly some people go off, but definitely a day a week more productive in that realm. 15% is the lowest study I've seen. I've seen about 25 to 28% but it averages around 20% more productive um, when they're actually given permission to do that. And many, many studies showed that people were more productive during the pandemic. This was from the New York Times, 75% um, the same or, or improved productivity. We saw the same number from our data. Uh, I mean, you just saw about three quarters of people more productive. And on the whole, as we're starting to see reporting coming out from companies, um, you know, we're going to really see this in the numbers as well. So productivity is a really easy one to address. Look at the data, definitely more productive um, overall. Secondly, innovation. Now there's been some noise about this. We're about to put a piece out on this. Um, the noise is, is unfortunate. It came from Microsoft. It came from them looking at their, their team's data, seeing that people became more kind of home team centric, right? So you, you spend more time talking to your own team less time interacting with other teams. And they were able to see that through their you know, Teams platform. Um, and they said, well, because of that, you know, we, we think pr uh, innovation might go down because of you know, more silos and things like this. But they never actually studied innovation. They never had any metrics or data or anything at all about innovation did actually go down. They just said, well, if we have less interaction, it might. But let's just look at the last year. I don't know if you noticed, but this was the most innovative year probably in all our lives pr professionally. Like more innovations happened just to get basic work done as well as in product and service and everything than ever. So we innovated massively. Of course, this was partially need, um, but it's also the fact that innovation doesn't require people in the same room. In fact, people in the same room makes innovation harder. <laughs> um, like literally the experience of like thinking deeply so you can have these breakthrough ideas and processing deeply these things are inhibited by being around other people. And you know the, the myth of the open plan office being great for innovation, no one's looked at how many people have headphones uh, when, they, you know, when they think about that. And the hard data on this is going open plan reduces interactions between employees. Uh, like, like having people together actually reduces interactions, increases emails um, compared to other things. So you gotta be careful of this bias people have that, you know, that will be, all be more innovative. Now that doesn't mean that it won't have benefits to bring people together sometimes. 
But are those benefits going to be available bringing them together for three days a month or three days every two weeks or, you know, or one day a week or something? Does it have to be you have to bring everyone back? No. So there will be some innovation benefits from randomly running into people. There will be some, but there are much higher costs from being forced to be less innovative every single day. And this is what we saw during the pandemic is people were able to do their own work, their own quiet, productive work better. So a couple of the pieces on this, and I said, we've got an article coming out on this, uh, but you know, brainstorming actually reduces original thinking, not increases it. 10%, this is a survey we did of 6,000 people, 10% of people do their best thinking at work. So we're gonna really bring them back to the office because to, to mess with like 90%. Um, there's a bunch of other things to say here. I won't dig too far into it, but essentially, the, the argument for innovation, all the indications point to um, greater autonomy will increase innovation and greater work from home will increase innovation. Those two things will increase innovation and provided you maintain a few principles, innovation should, uh, should really go up. Culture, it's another interesting one. I'd be curious to hear your experience there, Leanne. So culture is not the building. In fact, we have a piece by Tim can put it in the chat now. We have a piece we wrote called the culture was never the building and now it definitely isn't. Um, and it kind of walks through our point of view and, 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 and research on this. So culture is actually shared everyday habits. It's not where you work, it's actually how you work and interact with others. Um, and if anything, culture increased because we all actually spent more time watching how each other interacted. If anything, we, the tonnage of hours we spent watching other humans interact with other humans uh, at work, the tonnage of hours went up by like five times. Uh, we spent a lot more, we had a lot more FaceTime as, or, or Zoom time, um, literally watching how people worked. Um, and one of the results of that was culture actually became more evenly distributed. Now, that doesn't mean a bunch of people might be sad and, and go and, you know, leave the company because they want to, you know, be working full time. It doesn't mean a bunch of people might not wish that they could have, you know, more fun at the office. All those things are true. But um, on the whole, we shouldn't be seeing a problem with culture. And Hi, if you do hybrid right, you should be able to address the central issues with this. Um, Leanne, anything you want to add on culture before we go to... Uh, um, just, just, quick, just quickly, David, I actually think this is the hardest one. So, you know, I've noticed with leaders that I work with and the consortium I work with, people are getting it on autonomy. They're getting it on hybrid. They, but the question they're asking is, how do we keep our culture? And I, I, I do think this one's tough, and I don't think we should brush over it but the categorically are ways. The categorically are ways around keeping connections, making connections informal, giving more autonomy so that people can get together informally for themselves. Where we get a little bit troubled is with those people that have started during the pandemic and our early in career people that have never experienced the office. And so we just have to try doubly hard. And so I think something around making sure that everything is virtual Make, sometimes for some meetings, making sure, as David said, you have some sort of variety, but also making sure that your culture becomes based on something different. So right. our culture now, we're building on employee choice. And if you can reinforce that choice, your culture actually benefits. But this one's tough right. and it warrants an awful lot of thinking and an awful lot of discussion. And you need to work it through with your leadership. You need to right. take them there so that they're intentional about it. Yeah, I think there are two things that you'll need to be really intentional about. Culture is one, uh, and the other is bias, which I'll talk about in a minute. A couple of quick comments you know, coming in the chat. We will send an email afterwards with all the articles that we mentioned and the links to stuff to make that easy for you. So you'll get that after. And just, um, I, I do think that a monthly or every two week kind of culture time, if it works, you know, in your organization, if people are not too spread out, I think it's a great idea. Um, I think uh, we're going to do that and analyze best we can. We're going to have uh, you know, all hands meetings at specific points to kind of bring people together a little bit. I think that there's definitely some benefits to that. So hybrid doesn't mean everyone works at home the whole time. It means you're giving uh, your really good flexibility across the board and also giving the option to come and be together sometimes. The question is going to be, is that monthly? Is it every two weeks? Is it weekly? Is it, you know, how do you do that to kind of maximize the benefits? That will be interesting. I'm so curious about Madhuri's comment as well. I don't know if Madhuri, you're willing to put more in the chat about that. Madhuri Kuma saying 90 days ago, you onboarded a new job remotely, went to the office last week for the first time, the difference was stark. I'm still curious, I'm so curious um, what the difference was and what you noticed. And we, we don't know which company you're from, we won't mention that. So, you know, we can keep that private, but 
um, if you're willing to put anything else in the chat, I think we're all wondering um, what, uh, or what, you know, what that's about. But let's continue. So culture is something to work on and be intentional about. Um, but I think that the benefits for productivity, innovation, you know, um, diversity, you know, all these things, I think the benefits are worth, you know, doing the work on that. Now, this is the one I think is the biggest concern out there. And I think that you should be concerned. This is something that you need to be intentional about. Although I don't think it's an enormous issue if you can train managers in a few basic things. Like there are some things to teach people to do and make them as habits um, that can address a lot of the issues, right? So bias, um, you know, experience bias is one of the five big biases in the seeds model. Uh, experience bias will, you know, could give those in an office some unfair advantages. Uh, and distance bias could disadvantage people not in the office, right? So those things are true. Um, but there are some things you can do that can massively reduce that issue. For example, you can have a, a, a principle of one virtual, all virtual. So if you have everyone in the office, you know, at a meeting, great, do the meeting in person. But if half the team or even a couple of people are out of the office, then do the meeting where everyone's on an individual platform. Now you've leveled the playing field, as we've all experienced this week, this year, sorry. Um, now you don't, you're going to have much less experience bias, much less distance bias uh, for those people. And you're going to have a much more fair set of interactions. So I think what we've got to watch out for is going back to, you know, a bunch of people in a room talking over each other and a few people on speakerphone wondering where the next job is. Um, that's what we've got to be really careful of um, and, and, and really work on this, um, you know, leveling the playing field whenever you've got some people out of the office. That one habit, that one habit, if you can instill that, uh, will make will, will go a long way. There's definitely some others, um, but that one will be will be really really important. So um, let's let's pause it here from you for a minute. I'd love to hear in the chat, and we've got a hypothesis, but let's let's talk about the skills managers will need. Um, throw in the chat what what are some of the skills? Leanne was mentioning this. We're going to need to um, kind of retrain managers, or this is a great opportunity uh, to to really deepen their leadership skills, right? What do you think some of the skills are? So Kelly's first in with, with curiosity, open-mindedness, actively listening. What are some of the skills that you think people might need? And we think there's probably mindsets and processes and skills, um, kind of three different things um, to, uh, to, to work on. Someone's already said shift in mindset, yep. But what, is, what are some of those issues you think managers are gonna need to shift around? Lots of great things coming in. Let's hear from you. What kind of skills do you think people are going to need in this new world? Fantastic. Lots of great examples. So we've been thinking about this for a while. Um, and uh, in fact, we were, we were actually, I was working with uh, Leanne and the Flexwork Consortium with uh, Splunk and Uber and, and a bunch of others. And uh, I, I was saying, if you get, if you get, um, uh, if you can do hybrid well, you can mitigate the biases. And, and a bunch of the folks started saying, can you tell us how to do hybrid well? I was like, well, we've been talking about it for years, but we've never sort of synthesized it. So we spent the last few months synthesizing what it really takes to do hybrid well from the perspective of these skills managers need. So this, our, our theory is it's much better to do a few really central things well, like just a few things and do them really well and give them to everyone than it is to try and do a lot with a small group. So our hypothesis of culture change and learning is take as few as possible ideas, give them to the largest possible audience in the shortest time possible. So you get the panopticon effect and the social norming effect. Um, and that's how, that's how we think about it. So we started, uh, we've started piloting. Uh, we're in the early stages of piloting. We're excited about the, the design and feedback so far, but we're in the early stage of piloting a new solution called Flex, the neuroscience of hybrid leadership. Uh, I'll give you a quick outline of this, kind of tell you how we're thinking about it. But the overall goal is developing the specific mindset, skills, and processes to be highly effective in a virtual world. Um, we're teaching this in what we call our Hive approach. Now, we've been doing learning like this uh, for literally about 20 years. Uh, we've been doing really difficult learning um, on platforms or phone bridges. Uh, so it's not new for us at all. Uh, in fact, 78% of all learning was actually virtual before uh, the pandemic for us we were we were the majority of our learning was actually all virtual but this is this is essentially a month experience like a month sprint 30-day sprint very much about mindset session one so the new leaders mindset session two working in the new world so more about processes session three maximizing time together that's more about skills so across kind of mindset skills and processes 
We're trying to work out the absolute fewest kind of things people need. Um, give them a nice session each week, 80 minutes together, cohort, uh, and then go off and do assignments, including like read these research summaries, practice these specific skills, follow this guide, go and teach it to your team, go and introduce it to your team is really important. So very specific actions between each week. Um, and this is what we're thinking at the moment is the most important um, idea. So around mindset, we see two things, a growth mindset, con continual experiment, and really increase people's ability to empathize. So those are, those are the critical factors around mindset. We could do 10 things around mindset. We think these are the big two. Uh, around processes, how to maximize autonomy, a little bit on why, but a, a lot about how to maximize autonomy for important, really, really important process. Um, and then of course, goal setting, check-ins and feedback with fewer interactions. Um, and we might talk a little bit about that, Leanne, in a sec, um, your, your perspective on that. I think you had some interesting thoughts on that. Um, and then thirdly, uh, in terms of, of skills, like, like how to actually reduce bias in hiring, assigning, rewarding, promoting, like really how to make sure that happens and how to run fewer, shorter and better meetings. So skills for, for, for literally fewer, shorter, you know, faster meetings. We've developed three guides uh, for creating, reviewing and deciding that can really accelerate and speed up uh, collaboration in, uh, in this new world. So that's, that's how we're seeing it. Um, Leanne, your perspective on, um, just going, uh, I'll go back a couple of slides, your perspective, particularly on the, the kind of foundational skills people lead, what's your, what's your point of view here? Yeah, I think if you stay with the slide that you're on, actually, um, my, my sense here is that as I've watched leaders and managers, they actually have increased empathy. It has happened because they're going through the pain themselves. And when people go through pain themselves, they can empathize better. So that I'm not too worried about. I also noticed that an awful lot of the literature, an awful lot of the training out there is how to help people be more, show more empathy, more listening, et cetera. I think that will be okay, as long as we keep working at it. Keep the one I think is super critical and underrated is this goal setting piece. My whole sense of, of where we are is in order to allow people to be autonomous, You've got to start with talking to your manager about what do I have to deliver? Let's just agree the what. Let's just agree what you expect me to do over the next three months and what I think I can bring to the party. And then let me alone to do it. Give me the autonomy to do it. But that goal setting conversation becomes super crucial. It also becomes doubly crucial in hybrid, going back to biases, because if you've got those goals, you are going to reduce bias because X person who is remote and Y person who is in the office, you can look at them and determine their progress by how well they met their goals. And then thirdly, the real, the real underpin or the punch here on goal setting is people are feeling, you know, David talked about the pain. There's still a lot of places in the world where people are going through a lot of pain. What you need is the ability to feel good about something. And so if you have a goal, and you hit it and you knock it out of the park and you did it in an autonomous way, you're giving people the ability to feel good about yep. something. That's a huge thing. Yeah, absolutely. It actually increases their sense of status and their sense of certainty, as well as their shared goals with others, their sense of fairness. So it impacts positive SCARF, like all, all the domains of SCARF get, get hit in many ways. It's really powerful. Thanks, Leanne. That's great. So some people asking about uh, like the frequency, I think Vic's asking the frequency of check-ins. I mean, one of the things in this new world, the, the, you're going to have fewer interactions with people, so they have to be better. Um, you, you don't have time to like, you know, micromanage your people through every single project they're doing, because you're just not going to spend as much time, you know, FaceTime, literally, physically together. So the, the time you have has to be much more effective. It has to focus more on like inspiring people, motivating people, uh, identifying learning, unpacking roadblocks faster, like bringing people to their own insights, not just telling them what to do. You know, if you're a manager who just loves telling everyone what to do, you'll struggle in this time because you actually have to shift your style a lot um, to much more of a, of, of an, of a, a suggesting and asking style, much more of a, a softer style. So um, it's, there are going to be fewer interactions, so they have to be much better. Um, and for, from our perspective, that means they have to, you have to be generating less threat uh, more insights um, in the mind of the other person, and, and more, um, uh, you know, more of a growth mindset um, as well. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of interesting changes. So this is our hypothesis on this. Um, 
we are starting to, to pilot this. So if you're interested in this, there's going to be a poll go up in a minute or two. Um, you can also, if you don't want to answer the poll or you're wanting to jump off, you can just put the word flex, F-L-E-X in the chat and someone will follow up with you uh, if you're from an organization. Um, so you can either just put flex in the chat or uh, answer the poll in a moment. Um, but we've, we've built something here and I just want to tell you the Hive stands for high impact virtual experiences. It's an approach to learning that's quite different, like everyone on camera, people being called on constantly, quite challenging, very specific assignments between the sessions. Um, and we measure it really, really carefully. And this is some data we just pulled from three pilots of a solution called Ally, which we've just launched in three Fortune 100 companies. Uh, also some rapid development we did. Uh, but you can see, like in the last week, 72% of people helped amplify the voice of someone not being heard at least one to three times a week, right? 15% of people, you know, nearly every day, four to six times a week. So you can actually see in a quite granular way the impact that that program's having. And we're going to, we expect to see similar results from Flex, like real habits applied every single week because you're delivering it in this style, uh, because of the approach overall. So we've got some exciting data on that. So, you know, this is where we've ended up. Um, solve for autonomy, manage for fairness. We think that's the really big thing to do. Um, if, you know, if you need some help convincing your leadership of this, we're doing what we call uh, research briefings or executive briefings, where we'll get your leadership team together for an hour or 90 minutes and walk them through some of this research and others. But, but we think it's a really, really critical thing to solve for autonomy and manage for fairness. We think the big concerns, the two big ones to work on definitely are culture and, and, uh, and bias. Uh, and we're going to continue working on the, the tweaks and the nuances around that. We'll be studying those things and looking at the best ways to address culture and bias. Uh, you know, watch that, uh, watch that space. Um, and then we have a solution that's ready. If you're you know, trying to bring everyone back or partially back or do stuff crazy, we're, we're ready to scale this in June. Um, we're actually ready to scale this to pretty much any scale in June, July, August. Um, to uh, to get people ready for the fall as well. So, Leanne, any closing comments for you before we wrap up? And maybe Shada, you can put the poll up before people jump off, uh, so we know how to follow up. Any closing comments from you? No, I think the only well, I, I say no, and now I'm going to give you a comment. I, I guess the only thing that I'm going to say is, I really believe this is a, a a journey. I believe the paradigm shifted. I believe it's it's something that we can all do very differently now. The nature of work. And I would say, honestly, David has really helped us in our thinking. And I think blending the science with the experience and piloting and watching the data is going to be the way that we go forward in the next six months. I'll give you a very quick example. So we're opening up our offices so that people who want to come in, if they're vaccinated, can. They absolutely don't have to. And what we've said is we will watch the patterns of behavior for six months before we make any decisions at all about what the long term time, long time looks, looks like. Because this is a time where we've got to experiment, where we've got to do things differently, and we have really got to bring the science and the experience together. It is, it is time to, to experiment, isn't it? Um, and, and I know the FlexWork Consortium is doing some really interesting experiments, and that's part of the purpose of the group is to actually be able to share those those experiments, that data. Do you want to put in the chat, Leanne, the, the link for that? A few people are asking about that. We'd love to share that. Um, it's a really interesting consortium doing some, some really uh, important things. So feel free to put that link in the chat, Leanne, if you're able to do that, or one of my team can. Otherwise, um, it's, a, it's a really interesting uh, consortium. So we, we will send an email afterwards with, uh, with links to, to follow up from this. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, someone said you, you, you wanted to click more than one thing in the poll. Just put that in the chat if you'd like. If you put in the chat kind of the, the multiple things that you're interested in, we'll follow up uh, with you that way. But Leanna, huge, huge thank you for being here today. I know you're really, really busy there. Um, I really appreciate uh, your passion for, for uh, leveraging this moment to, uh, to actually build a much better normal. Um, and I know that your passion is going to actually improve the lives of hundreds of thousands of people, if not much bigger numbers. Um, and hopefully between all of us, we can uh, make organizations better for humans <laughs> through science. Let's do it. Let's and look do at it. that, make them more productive at the same time, right? Isn't that the idea? So thank you so much for your partnership and passion. Thanks, Shade as well. And uh, Shade, I'll hand back to you.